Incline planes. This topic is sometimes covered in grade 11, sometimes covered in grade 12. I'll cover it here, and for the purposes of this course, this is one of our optional videos. The trick with an inclined plane, something on an angle like this, is that if we have an object, I'm going to make it a ball because I want to imagine it rolling down the surface. And I recognize the force is acting on this object. The force of gravity is going to pull straight down. And the normal force acting on the object is going to have to stay normal to the surface, like that. Now the trick here, unlike with flat objects where the normal force and the force of gravity equaled each other out, is that these two objects obvious these two forces obviously can't cancel each other out. They're not even in they're not even in completely opposite directions. See, imagine this ball was trying to move through the plane. It would be trying to move this way. So the force that resists that has to be going normal to the surface. It has to be going the opposite direction. A plane or a surface doesn't resist an object from moving across the top of it. Well, it does, and we call that friction, and we're not quite there yet. But it, do but it does keep it from moving through it. And so that's what we're looking at here. Imagine that this force of gravity has two components. There's a component to this force of gravity that is going straight into the plane. And there's a component to this force of gravity that's going down the plane. The normal force and this force of gravity are the two parts that are like usual. That's how much gravity is trying to pull this object through the surface. And that's how much normal force then is there to keep that from happening. Those two are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. They cancel each other out. And that's the normal force of gravity and normal force that we talk about in all of these questions. In this case, we'll call it force of gravity perpendicular. Perpendicular because it's perpendicular to the, to the incline itself. What's left, though, or what's left unaccounted for, is this little section of the force of gravity right here. He is right here. He is free to cause acceleration. Sometimes this is called FG parallel, because we can imagine that that component is parallel to the surface in question. Now we're just going to do one more thing here before we start looking at this from a numerical standpoint and that is try and figure out these angles. This angle right here would typically be called the angle of the incline and if we imagine a right angle triangle this angle right here then would be 90 minus theta because this forms a right angle triangle where this is theta, this is 90 minus theta, and this is 90, and that all adds to 180. This little angle right here then, which is the angle we need to get these components of the force of gravity, this one right here I mean, this is a right angle, so this and this must add to 90. So this is 90 minus theta, so let's call this one alpha for lack of a better name. 90 minus theta plus alpha is equal to 90. And so what we can get here is that alpha, well, I'll bring the 90 minus 90 plus theta alpha. Alpha is equal to theta. So this little angle here actually is theta too. So the way that works is this is theta. Because of the right angle triangle, this is 90 minus theta. And if this totals to 90, and this is 90 minus theta, then this must just be theta right here. Um, if you like that kind of geometry from your grade 9 math class, then that's great. But if you're having a little bit of trouble with that, we can think about it a slightly different way that I think is a little bit more easy to understand and useful. Imagine we try to rotate this so that instead of the plane being flat, what we've really done here is we've used this as our new coordinate system. See, we broke our force of gravity down according to these new coordinates. So what if I rotated it so that my coordinate system is now flat? That would take my incline and it would flatten it out. Okay? This isn't real. We've rotated our view. What would, call it, what would happen then is that the force of gravity would end up swinging out. It used to be straight up and down, but as we rotated, so it used to be right here, but as we rotate it, it rotates over through an angle. Now, the normal force, which used to be up on an angle, rotates over and ends up going straight up and down. 
And what you can see if you want to compare these two diagrams is you can imagine actually just turning your head and looking at them separately. So one diagram you can look at, and if you turn your head with the other diagram, you can see that the two things correspond with each other. Now, what you can think about is how much, how many degrees did you have to turn this incline so that it rotated flat? How far did you have to bring it down? And the answer to that is obviously theta. So if this used to be up and down, but it got rotated through an angle of theta, what angle is right here? Well, that's got to be theta too, right? Because it used to be straight up and down, and that's how far it got moved out, theta as well. So if I'm breaking my force of gravity into components, where I've called that and that, and this is FG perpendicular, then what I can see is if this is my total force of gravity, then this component of it, because this is the adjacent side, would end up being Fg cos theta. And this component of it would end up being Fg sin theta. Now, we keep in mind that the normal force and this force are equal and opposite and cancel each other out and so essentially we can a lot of the time ignore this but when we get into calculating forces of friction it's going to be useful to be able to come up with that number as well so with this in hand I don't care if you want to sort of use this diagram when creating this problem or this diagram when creating this problem what we can see that's important here is that the net force that's left to cause acceleration is this parallel component of the force of gravity. So let's do a couple simple problems with that and we'll work our way through. So here we have a 10 meter long ramp. Uh, ball is resting at the top of the 10 meter long ramp and it's inclined at 30 degrees. Ignoring any rolling friction, friction, what speed will the ball be when it leaves down the ramp? Now, this, like a lot of these problems, I didn't actually give you a mass for the ball, so we'll just call it M. This is a good rule of thumb, especially with mass. If you feel like you need it and you don't have it, you probably don't need it. So you should just keep moving forward and hope that it will cancel out in the equations at some point. Here's my force of gravity acting on this ball. Here's my normal force. Here's my perpendicular and parallel component. And if this is 30 degrees, this is 30 degrees. So now this force of gravity has a total value of 9.8 m. And my perpendicular component would be Fg cos theta. But since him and him are going to be equal and opposite, I don't really even worry about it. This Fg parallel is really the interesting thing. So it's the opposite side of that triangle. So that means it's going to be equal to Fg sine theta, which works out to, in this case, 9.8 m sine 30. On your calculator, you can see that that's 4.9 m, or 4.9 times the mass. And of the three forces acting on the object, that's the only one that didn't cancel out. So F net is equal to the Fg parallel. In this case, that means that 4.9 m is equal to ma using Newton's second law. In canceling those masses, few it worked out, I get an acceleration of 4.9 meters per second squared. I've been a little bit um, sloppy with my signs here. You might have called that negative 9.8 m. And then you might have eventually gotten uh, to the point where you had a negative 4.9 meters per second squared. But what I find with inclined plane questions specifically is that because some people will view the object moving down the plane like it's moving in the x direction, some people like to call it a positive acceleration. If this was my coordinate system, right, this object is moving down this way, that's positive x. Alternatively, people that are viewing this, still in terms of that old coordinate system they're using, 
see that this uh, motion is sort of moving in the negative y direction and they like to view this as a negative acceleration. I think I like to view inclined plane questions in the new coordinate system and so I like to treat this like a positive. It's not wrong to do it either way. Remember that signs in this part of physics are simply referring to direction and since you set up your direction as a convention at the beginning of a question, it's totally up to you. Also quickly I'd like to address what this would look like if you decided to use the rotated diagram instead. So let's say you've rotated your diagram this way by 30 degrees and so this plane has become flat. Here's your um, mass of a ball, your force of gravity has swung out this time, this is 30 degrees, here's your normal force, Fg perpendicular and Fn are equal and opposite and cancel each other, and Fg parallel sits right here. It's still the opposite end of this triangle, it's still equal to 9.8 m sine 30, which works out to 4.9 newtons, and then you can do the math the same way. But I think you can see when you look at this through the rotated view, why somebody who did this whole problem from the rotated point of view would want to call that a positive, and somebody who did it from this point of view might want to call it a negative. I like to think of things usually as rotated, that's easier for me and so I like to call this one a positive. It's resting at the top, which means my vo initial velocity is zero. I've got a displacement on the ramp of 10 meters, and what I want to know is what is my final velocity as this object comes off the ramp. So, started with dynamics, used Newton's second law to get to a kinematics or five equations of motion problem, to a d equals v2 squared minus v1 squared, 2 times 4.9 times 10 v2 squared minus 0. I guess I should put units in to be a little more proper. Meters per second squared and meters. So that's 98 on this side. 98 meters squared per second squared. Uh, v2 squared, so v2 works out to be the square root of that, which I guess is 9.9, .9, but let me just double check. 9.9 .9 meters per second. If you're using the convention where this is a negative, then maybe at this point you would have called this negative 9.9 .9 meters per second, but I'm again sticking with that as the positive direction. So there you go, 9.9 .9 meters per second is the speed that that object would come off. Force of gravity isn't cancelled out by the normal force, there's some component of it left. We figure out what component is left and treat that as the net force. That net force leads to an acceleration and we have a five equation motion problem. Skiers traveling uphill at a speed of 7.5 meters per second. So we're going up here at 7.5 meters per second. The skier travels a distance of 10.5 meters before, before stopping. So they're going to go 10.5 meters up before they stop. Assuming friction is negligible, determine the angle of the incline. So this is the theta that I'm interested in. Um, I've got kinematics information at the beginning of this question. I've got a displacement a velo and two velocities. So I'm going to use this formula. Remember even if it's not clear why, if you have kinematics information, you're doing a forces question, just find acceleration and it'll work itself out. So what I've done here is I've treated up the incline as positive. So since I'm slowing down as I go up that incline, I'm going to get a negative acceleration. I'm 
negative 2.68 meter, meters per second squared. Now we said assuming friction is negligible. So what we must be assuming then is that the only thing that's causing the net force that's slowing this object down is the force of gravity that's perpendicular to the incline. Using MA, FG equals MA, I can recognize that that force of gravity perpendicular is going to equal mass times negative 2.68 meters per second squared. When I have variables hanging around in equations, I often like to just simplify and avoid the units. I find it makes it a little bit easier. So I have that M there represents a mass, and I'm just going to leave it hanging around as a mass, just like I did in the last question, hoping that it'll cancel itself out. Now, here's my object sitting on the incline. Here's the incline. I don't know the angle. I've got a force of gravity going down and a normal force. This component and this component cancel each other out. Theta, if this is theta, that's theta. So this Fg parallel is equal to negative 9.8 m sine theta. And I'm calling it negative because if you recall all the way back up here, I called positive this way. So this is negative. So I've got two expressions for Fg parallel. One, negative 2.68 m. And the other one, is equal to negative 9.8 m sine theta. Since the m's cancel out, the only unknown in that equation is theta, so we can solve for it directly. 2.68 divided by 9.8. Now a math person might get worried that I'm constantly canceling these masses out and treating it like you can divide by a variable. And they might say, but if the variable, if the variable is equal to zero, then that doesn't work. But remember, these variables are representing the mass of an object. So the mass of an object isn't going to be zero, and so we don't have to worry about that. So there we go, we get 15.9 degrees. So, given our kinematics information, we can find the acceleration. Assuming that acceleration is being caused by the force of gravity down the plane, we can set up those two equations for force of gravity down the plane, and we can see what incline must have led to that acceleration. So there's a couple extensions on uh, incline planes.